All right. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today. Uh, we're delighted to be here to discuss Carlos Labe's book, Spiritual Choreographies, with Carlos, his translator, Will Vanderheiden, and his publisher, Chad Post. This event is part of the Authors Guild Foundation's From Manuscript to Marketplace series, in which authors and members of their publishing team discuss the process of creating and publishing their works. And um, this is, uh, just as a side note, this is our second Manuscript to Marketplace events where uh, we have incorporated a translation um, element in which we are very excited um, about because it just adds another nuance and dynamic to the conversation. Um, uh, I don't know how many um, in the audience are translators, I hope a lot, <laughs> but uh, the Guild uh, just recently launched its uh, translators group and uh, we are working on a lot of new initiatives in the coming year for translators specifically um, that also includes a model literary translation contract uh, that breaks down the various terms of a translation agreement and explains them and gives negotiating um, um, suggestions. Um, from Manuscript to Marketplace, this series is made possible by the New York State Council on the Arts and the Authors Guild Foundation, which is the charitable and educational arm of the Authors Guild. It educates, supports, and protects American writers to ensure that a rich, diverse body of literature can flourish. It does this by advocating for authors' rights, educating authors across the country in the business of writing, and promoting an understanding of the value of writers. We also want to thank the American Literary Translators Association, ALTA. I was just at their conference in Rochester, New York, wonderful people, wonderful place, for partnering with us on this webinar. So this discussion will be followed by a Q&A session. And if you are, uh, have never attended one of these uh, webinars before, uh, you should note that there is a Q&A box kind of on the bottom of the screen and you can open it up to send in your questions. And at the end of um, the conversation, Chad will um, read them and uh, the attendees will answer. So I'm just gonna quickly introduce the panelists and the book and then we'll uh, get started. So Carlos Labe, one of Granta's best young Spanish language novelists was born in Chile and is the author of eight novels, including Navidad and Mat Matanza and two collections of short stories. In addition to his writings, he's a musician and has released four albums. He's co-editor at Sangria, a publishing house based in Santiago and Brooklyn. Chad W. Post is the director of Open Letter Books and the managing editor of 3%. He's the author of The 3% Problem, Rants and Responses on Publishing, Translation, and the Future of Reading. Uh, I'm going to get that book. <laughs> uh, and the 2018 recipient of the Ottawa Award for promotion of international literature. Will Vanderheiden is a freelance translator of Spanish and Latin American literature. He has received fellowships from the NEA and the Lannan Foundation. His translation of Rodrigo Fresan's The Invented Part won the 2018 Best Translated Award for Fiction. A little about Carlos's book, Spiritual Choreographies. At once an exploration of collective creation as a kind of real community and a reflection on the fragility of memory. Spiritual Choreographies is an undaunted and entirely original novel by one of Latin America's most innovative contemporary writers whose body of work has been described as a response to the imminent destruction of the known world. It's very, very excellent. Um, excited to read that, I haven't yet. So uh, with that, I will pass it on to Chad Post, who will uh, continue the rest of the webinar. And I uh, hope you guys uh, have some good questions for, the, for this wonderful, eminent group of uh, publisher, author, translator. Thanks, Chad. Thank you. Thank you very much you, for the introduction and for setting this up. And thanks to everyone who is watching us now. Um, I know that we are going to talk mainly about spiritual choreographies or about that. That's kind of the, the main focus of this particular webinar. But as we were talking about this beforehand, it's clear that we can't really start there. That for an author like Carlos, who we published three books by, Navidad Matanza, La Cuela, and Spiritual Choreographies, it's not just a story about bringing this particular manuscript to the marketplace, but it's about the whole, exp the whole experience of marketing multiple books and bringing three of his books to the marketplace and being able to, uh, to promote him over a number of series of years. Um, I think that I really want you to talk, Will, about how we first came to be working with Carlos's work, but I do want to mention that the first time 
I ever came across Carlos's name was through the Granta issue, um, which is a very particular honor. I, a lot of people that are listening probably are aware of this, but back in 2012, 2011, 10. 10. Yeah. I'm, no, so a decade ago, um, yeah. there was, uh, Granta did a special issue called the best young Spanish language novelist. And they picked people who are all under the age of 40. Um, and that, Focus specifically on novelists, not just people who had written short stories or, or other pieces, but had to have had a novel and selected a number of them. I forget what the total number of, of authors that are in the book are. Is 15, some, I think. Is it 15? Yeah. And, um, and put together their special issue with uh, interview or information about the author, uh, a sample of their work, a um, lot of information like that, special online things. We even did at that point in time a Twitter a Twitter conversation about about the, about uh, about the Granta issue, which was like the biggest uh, marketing mistake that I think I've ever been involved in. Where there's no such thing as conversation in Twitter to begin with, but if everyone's trying to ask a question and respond to it using hashtags, you start getting all these people retweeting the same thing, and your whole feed just becomes chaos. It lasted about seven minutes before I just like hung up. Twitter and hung up my phone and was like, okay, that's not, not going to happen. But I did as part of, um, part of what open letter does, we have our publishing house that does 10 books a year, all in translation. We also have 3% this website to promote um, the discussion around international literature and translation and the art and craft of translation. And for Granta, we did a special series in which we highlighted every single author who was in the issue. So there is an, there's a post about Carlos on the website focuses on the music. I think we have a inserted video, a lot of like fun stuff that's part of it. And, uh, and that was the first time that I encountered your work was through there. But I think that to talk about this as like a manuscript to marketplace thing, Will is the essential link to making your book come into full existence. So Will, do you want to talk about your experience here at the, the university and how this came to be? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I read, read Carlos for the first time in 2010. Sorry if I'm echoey in a very empty room here. Um, in that issue of Granta. And it was, the, it was translated by Natasha Wimmer, that, that excerpt. Um, and it really grabbed me. It's really just, it made me just, you know, I was just fascinated with the author and, and also with Natasha's work as a translator. Um, and so I ended up um, buying the book reading the book, along with some of other Car Carlos's other books. Um, and it, this was also around the time I was first starting to, to, to try to work as a literary translator. Um, about the same time I applied to the MA program at the University of Rochester. And in sort of preparation for um, starting that program, I just translated a complete draft of Navidad and the Tagza. Um, just to practice, to try to learn how to translate, how to capture a voice. Um, and then, yeah, and then I went to, went to the University of Rochester again in 2012. Um, and that's where I met Chad for the first time. And it became clear pretty early on that we had similar tastes in, in literature, and especially in um, sort of more experimental Latin American literature. And he had also, you know, he had also read Carlos and Granta, and when he found out I had a full translation of that manuscript, he was very interested in it, and it ended up becoming my thesis project while I was doing my master's there. Um, and Chad was my advisor, and, or one of my advisors on, for my thesis. Um, and yeah, over the course of me doing, finishing the master's, it also just kind of emerged that Open Letter was, was um, interested in publishing the book. Um, so that became my first book length published translation. Um, also during that, the, that same year was when I first met or first got in touch with Carlos. Um, he had moved, recently moved from Chile to, to New York and, uh, and yeah, I wanted to publish, I wanted to, I submitted one of his short stories to, to have it published by an online magazine. And so I contacted his agent um, to get permission to do that. And, uh, and then later that year, once, once it was clear that Open Letter wanted to publish Navidad and Matanza and they contracted me to translate it and, bought, and gotten the rights to it, um, Carlos and I started to correspond regularly. 
Um, and as I worked through the translation, you know, multiple drafts at that point, but like as, a, as we were pre preparing it for publication, um, I started to ask Carlos questions, you know, the things that came up during the translation process and he was able to read the translation. And so we, uh, yeah, developed a pretty close correspondence at that point. Um, yeah, and then I guess the book was published in the spring of 2014. Um, yeah. Chad could probably talk more about the, the marketing and stuff that went into that. Um, but the first time we all actually met in person was when we did an event together in Rochester to launch the book. Um, and since then, we've really, you know, not only had this professional relationship of doing three books together, but we've all been, been, we've been really good friends over the years, you know, seeing each other whenever we can. We, we keep in regular contact. Uh, Carlos came to my wedding in Puerto Rico. Carlos That's very good. both went to Chad's <laughs> wedding in, in Rochester. That's very good, too. Um, so yeah, so we, so yeah, uh, we've been good friends and had a long, long-standing professional and personal uh, relationship. I want to add something to your story, Will, um, if you don't mind, is that the way that the way that we really got to do Navidad and Matanza, the first of the books, and sort of made the plans to be able to do a number of Carlos's books was thanks to you being in the publishing class and writing a reader's report. Um, and for anyone, I mean, most people probably know what a reader's report is, but it's usually an internal document that a press will use to evaluate whether or not they want to go ahead with pursuing a particular title. So we get tons of like uh, what we refer to as a slush, slush pile um, of manuscripts that are submitted from various translators. And when possible, we'll have someone read the book and write like a synopsis or like all the facts of the book, a sort of analysis of how the book works and how it works as a as a piece of literature and then a recommendation as to whether open letters should be pursuing it or if it's not a book for us and in my class on literary publishing um they make all the students write at least write one one reader's report on a book that we are literally considering and with the grad students i always leave it up to them to bring a book that they want to pitch essentially one that they want to work on one that they think might fit our list but that is something that they're already passionate about and Will wrote, um, to, to embarrass him, wrote probably one of the best reader's reports that we've ever had in the class. It's one that I have still online for all the future students read that as the example of the reader's reports that they should be working on because it is incredibly, con con it's incredibly convincing. And I've been thinking a lot about this um, recently after Alta where we had these pitch sessions between translators, uh, translators pitching to publishers and just generally I've been more involved with a lot of people at Breadloaf and emerging translators who are trying to get their foot in the door. And there is, there is something that's very important, I think, about how you talked about the book and how you presented it and the way that it is, it was a way of interpreting and reading the book and not just saying simply, this is a great book that needs to do, that needs to be published. But instead it was like, here is how this book is important or why it fits into your literary aesthetic and what it means within the world today. And by being able to position Carlos and the book through this interpretive lens, it's a much more compelling narrative for a publisher to decide to do. I mean, you have to, if you're a translator, we've talked for years about translators being the major connective tissue of taking the, the literature that they know about from their language or the country that they specialize in, and then getting it to a particular publisher and convincing them they should, they should publish it. You act as ambassadors, you act as like mini sub agents of a kind, but there is something there, there, it is worth taking that very seriously and thinking about what it means to be able to pitch to a publisher and what a publisher might be looking for. And that it wasn't just like, hey, it's a good book, but it was like, here is what's interesting about this. This is why it's ex the experimental nature of this book works and how it's partially a game and how that idea of this book as a game or literature as a game is very much in keeping with these other people that you are in the sort of uh, constellation of open letter type of authors and how that all interacts. And that's incredibly valuable. And, and, uh, and Carlos, you should be proud that you have someone who is so passionately, passionate and brilliant and able to, to do that because that makes a would, massive difference. I would say, I, I would like to say something about that. I, I feel like I, I'm a very lucky and but at the same time, um, non-regular, uh, translated author in, in a way that I'm, I have been present in, in the whole process for the three books. Because um, 
I was uh, talking to Elvira Navarro, the Spaniard uh, writer, uh, like a year ago. She had a translation uh, uh, recently in uh, Two Line Press. Two Lines? Yep. Two Lines, right? Um, and, she, uh, and I asked her, are you excited to be translated uh, to English in, in the United States? Big country, so different to Spain. Uh, it's supposed to be a big step forward for someone to go to the, main, the I think it's the biggest market in the world or, or so, right? Yeah, totally. And she told me, you know, well, it, she's a Spaniard. They have a big market too. And they are a little bit uh, short-sighted and uh, as Spaniards, you know, I'm Chilean. Um, mm -hmm. She said, you know, it's exciting, it's exciting but, but I, don't, I don't really care. It's, it's great. But between you and me, I prefer, I, I, I'm, I'm most excited uh, about being translated to French. Huh. Of course, they are European. So I was wondering, how, how can I make her, I, I, I really like her, I can consider her a friend. That's why I'm talking about uh, all this nonsense about her. Um, how can I show her the importance of being translated in the United States? But, but at the same time, I, I, I wonder, maybe I'm thinking about that because I live in the, in the United States. I have been here almost 10 years. And so that's my, my take. I have been almost take 10 years and I have the, the, I was very lucky to, in the first uh, year I was into the Granta uh, issue. Uh, then uh, Chad contacted me and I, I started like uh, correspond with Will about the translation and immediately felt like I was going into a literary community. Uh, and I, I really felt like, I, I didn't felt at all like, because in Chile I, I'm, I'm very uh, um, engaged in the literary community and the political community and you know, it's my country. And at the same time, when, when we moved here, me and Monica R uh, Ramon Rios, she's, a, she's also a writer. We came because she started uh, st studying here and we came as a couple. So I was a little bit afraid of like uprooting me, right? Uh, like feeling lost. But then I, I quickly I found a community. As a, as a writer, I'm very lucky. So, uh, and then we started working together. Um, so my, my take on this is uh, it must be very different for you guys, for you, Will, and you, Chad, working without the, the author always present. I know I could be a pain in the ass sometimes, like, hey, Chad, how, how is doing with this? Uh, hey, Will, um, uh, I, uh, let's talk again about that. I'm not really like that, but... but uh, when, when you are in, in Chile, back in Chile, like very far away, you can, you can just send me an email and, and let me uh, answer a couple of days later. But here we are almost in the same, in the same place. That's true. There is, in relation to that, I have a couple of thoughts right away. One is that um, America is not the best country for generating a dialogue around literature. We tend to be so commercially focused and so bestseller focus that if a book isn't sale, successful sales-wise, it tends to get sort of ignored or hushed up. And even like with, when a book's just coming out, most of the, most of like the quote unquote review attention will be like a listicle of like a book that you should read. Yeah. It has like a little comment, but there's not like, there's not a lot more to that. And I feel like in places like Spain and Europe in particular, Spain, France, wherever, there's a lot more engagement around the narrative describing the book and interpreting the book and having a reading of the book, which, which I could see then being putting, putting myself into her position or someone else's position from as a Spanish author being like, yeah, it's fine. That's in America, but people don't really review the book or talk about it. So like yeah. there, but it's not, it's not as rewarding at the same time from like a, a general perspective, if you can get translated into English, it's more likely that you'll be translated into other languages throughout the world thus helping amplify your general community. Um, there's also an honor that Spanish is the second and third most translated language on an, on an annual basis, because we, we run a translation database that tracks all new books that are, that are published in, in, in America in translation. And it's German, 
French and Spanish are the top three languages every year without fail. Um, and, but even with, even given that, it's only like a couple hundred, if that, it's usually like 120, maybe 115 titles from Spanish that are being translated into English for the first time ever. And that's for all the Spanish speaking writers of the world of like from Spain, from all of South America, from Mexico, from like anywhere. That's a very small percentage when you stop to think about it. We have on submission, no fewer than 30 Spanish titles at this moment in time in which we will probably do two or three. So like the, the ability to just get into that grouping means a lot. And there is that chance that you could become the next Bolaño and be a big selling title that then takes on a global sort of, of uh, uh, I was gonna say uh, anticipation, like momentum um, because of what happens here in the States. There is, I, to sort of talk about the marketing part of this. So we, we talked about uh, Navidad Matanza as being the first book, which we did an event here in Rochester. We all got together. It was very, very fun. The second book we did was La Quela, which is like a year and a half later. We, Open Letter, had switched distribution then which is a key to this. When we did Navidad and Matanza, I was calling every bookstore to try and get them to carry our books, um, which is a lot of work and uh, not always successful. And for Loquela, we had switched over to Consortium, who was able to send out sales reps to a lot of stores to be able to tell them to carry the book. So there's like an automatic, like <laughs> the difference yeah. between those two things is cannot be overemphasized. But one of the things that most intrigues me about your writing, Carlos, and that is really affected the way that we think about bringing this to the marketplace and to find readers. Um, and in a way, like saying marketplace to me is sometimes a little bit weird because we're a nonprofit with an explicit goal of trying to increase and diversify readerships and like connect people and to do things that are more more book related than solely like sales. And Marketplace seems to indicate that sales, like bringing it to a place where people will purchase it. And we wanna do more that's like a little bit more nebulous, but a little bit more altruistic and like preserving voices and types of literature that otherwise wouldn't survive in the Marketplace <laughs> and be able to find as many readers as we can for them. And so with the marketing for your books, one of the things that's been, that, that's, that has sort of shaped it is the fact that your books are unflinchingly smart and, and intellectual, like they don't, it's not, a, they never appeal, they never, they never explicitly try to become less of this like rigorous, intelligent work of art to try and appeal to a larger readership. So rather than trying to get like the typical BuzzFeedy sort of, sort of review coverage, we've liked to do things that are much more geared towards exploring the book and the nature of the writing. So with Loquela, with the second book, the thing that I always remember about that is that we did the event together in Dallas at Wild Detectives Bookstore in Dallas, where you and I just, I just interviewed you and talked about and tried to understand the book and explain to people how to read it. And there is a post on 3% that's basically recapping that and giving people a sort of roadmap to getting into a book that is very tricky. And that, I mean, to the general audience would be considered experimental, difficult, whatever. But we're, but we're always trying to think of how to open that up to an audience rather than just to push them to buy it. That there's more yeah. to reading a book than buying it. Sales and that was, and that was radicalized in the, in the new one, in the spiritual choreographies. Because, uh, <laughs> Locuela, uh, uh, bless you. <laughs> Locuela uh, is, is hard, but it's, it's a lot um, metafictional. You have a lot of references, Borges, Cortázar, Onetti. And in some way, I, I, I consider myself lucky because as a Chilean, when I came here, Bolaño was exploding too. So, in, in, uh, and that, that's what I hated and liked it about Bolaño. And, and, and I'm a, um, I, I made my, my M, MA uh, dissertation in Bolaño. So I came here like to explain Bolaño to the American reader. And at the same time, my, my writing is not Bolañesque at all. Or maybe a little bit. Maybe Locuela was, uh, of the three books, maybe it's the most Bolañesque. And the new one, Spiritual Choreographies, is, is the less Bolañesque, uh, maybe because of that, because I get fed, I, I got fed, I get, uh, yeah, <laughs> you get it, uh, about Bolaño, and I reacted, and I, I, I got in the, in the opposite uh, direction. The good way is, you, you guys got me, uh, we got all the nuances and, and, and the project itself, and you chat and an open letter, uh, you, you, you decided to go like this jump without net. Because the, the thing about spiritual choreographies is 
And I decided in that novel in, in Spain, when, when I published uh, three years ago, I think, uh, not to include any name, any, any city, any uh, place, and any, any name uh, of, of a character. So it's a very hard book because it's, it uh, deliberately has no reference, no di direct reference to anything. Uh, in some way, trying to destroy all the marketable uh, com convention. So, and the only the only reference it has is the music, because it's a it's a novel about music. Uh, so, in some way, I I was expecting. Chad, you were saying that uh, you decided to market my book, my books uh, only focusing the text, and I really love that kind of marketing. And I know it's so hard in the United States because here everything refers to a story. This is my story and your story refers to a, another one. This is my community. The books, I, I understand now here, books belong to a community and I love that too. Uh, Toni Morrison, she's the best because she represents a very, uh, uh, a community that has been treated not fair uh, in, the, in the United States. And me as a Latino, I should I should be doing the same. The, the thing is, I come from a, from a country that every where everything is neoliberal and everything is about market. So I am, you know, you can think about Chile like a double United States. Everything there has to be double uh, uh, marketable. So my reaction as a writer when I was uh, younger was being the opposite. And that's why people notice my, my, my work. So this guy is going in the opposite way. Yeah. And maybe my, my only good thing as a writer is that I'm bold. So I decided to do this book, like non-marketable book. And Will and Chad decided to, to go with it. And that's like an, an impossible burger, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's very true. And it, it is one of the things that's been developed, I think, in our, our working relationship over the, these years, too, is that we are trusting in you to do, we are, A, invested in your, your literary career. That, and unlike, like, another, you can envision a, a commercial press, and generally for people who are listening who are either translators or writers, you frequently have, like, one shot. So you get, like, you get a book yeah. into a press that's a, that invested X amount of money, and if the book does not turn a profit, if, unless there's like some other cultural reason, they'll tend to drop that author. And we're never, we don't do that as frequently as, sometimes, sure, there are books that we've only done one, or authors that we've only done one book from, but it's not because of like sales reasons. So there would be always be some other backstory to it. But we wanted to invest in your career and make sure that we knew, like we knew from the start that, look, that Navidad and Matanza would not be the only book of yours that we published and that your audience would grow over time and your reputation would grow over time. So part of discussing with, with you guys the, the doing spiritual choreographies, part of that conversation revolved around what's next for your readers. So if people read these in some sequence, like they, it's weird to think that way because everyone knows that in the marketplace, people are really focused on the singular book. They never really know that off, they don't really pay attention to who the translator is, unfortunately. They don't pay attention to who the publisher is. They just like hear about a book and they read that book for the most part. There's a group of us, obviously, that are involved in like translation and in publishing and in this world that care about those other things. But your average reader on the street or like the average student in my class, they just know like, oh, I, I've read, I've read, uh, I've read the uh, Margaret Atwood, but they don't know like who published Margaret Atwood or who like any of that that backstory, yeah. that book. Um, but with your books, because of what they are, like it seemed to make more sense to think of it as sort of a pathway, almost like an Onetti sort of pathway where you start out here and you're doing this sort of aesthetic movement. Laquela builds on that or alters it or complicates it some way. Spiritual choreographies takes it to the next step. And you have other books that we could have done instead of spiritual choreographies. But as a, as a publisher, we want to support the two of you creating these projects that fit together and know that you know what this should be like. So we've relied a lot upon your selection process for what book we do in what order. Yeah. You know, and Will, you, you want to add something? Because I was thinking about the, what, what you guys do with Fresan or yeah. what New Directions has made with uh, Cesar Aira. Um, and I think, uh, for instance, in the case of Margaret Atwood, right now she's like the best uh, English writer, I think, uh, ever. Like, 
in a white sense, like uh, uh, she's popular, she's uh, relevant, she writes very well, and um, but now she's old, so people can see her her work as a whole. Yeah. Uh, and that's great that there's uh, uh, translators and uh, publishers that they they can take the risk of um, building a, a sense of a complete work. I always think uh, in, a, in my work as a um, movement, a progressive movement, uh, maybe when I die, I don't know when, uh, people will, will say like, this is, the, this is the aesthetics of this guy, uh, or this, this is the perfect way to market him. Uh, Bolaño is easy to market because he died, so they can build the, the whole picture and they can, yeah, and they can find like, uh, uh, oh, I found a new novel uh, that, that helps to, to understand that, that part of his uh, work. Um, mm -hmm. But in some way, it's, I think it's very wise from a market point of view, because right now the TV shows are, are the most profitable thing. And TV shows build in sequence, in like projecting in time, right? It's not like a movie. You go to see a great movie and there's nothing more to market. Uh, but a TV show, you, you have a lot. That's, that's, yeah. really that's interesting. Think, for me, thinking about how we came to do spiritual choreographies after doing Loquella, um, I felt like, I don't know that we had, that we talked about it enough to have this sort of full vision of where it fit in your work generally. To me, it was sort of like the excitement of the fact that you were working on it at the time. It was about to come out in Spanish when I started translating it. And you were very excited about it because it was your new, newest thing. And I got, I got caught up in that. And I think Open Letter did as well because that was, because we were really decisive about saying that it was the next book we should do. But I can also imagine other scenarios where, where we would have done a different, gone a different way with a different yeah. because Because it is, because spiritual choreography is particularly challenging. And like you're saying, it's almost anti-marketable anti in some ways. Yeah. I think we did a pretty good job with like capturing what it's about in, in the jacket copy and, and in that different ad copy and, and in various interviews that we did. And I think it is also of the moment in some ways, although it's kind of utopian in some ways, which feels like maybe. Yeah, I think part of the decision was it's, it's a very optimistic. Novel. Yeah, it's, it's hopeful in a way yeah. that, that it's hard to, hard to latch onto sometimes these days. But, but at the same time, like it was, it was a very exciting new project. And I think that's really what, what led us to, to think that it should be the next book. Um, yeah, but I, I wouldn't say that it was the, the right or wrong choice. I think it was the right choice, but it was, um, yeah. but it was a choice. So, yeah, and you yeah. never know what's going to come out in the, market, in the marketplace, I guess, which is something I have no expertise. <laughs> and involves a lot of luck. Although I will say that this is the first book of yours that has words as a title that people understand. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> Which is a, a plus. <laughs> it's a milestone, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, like real breaking with tradition there. Like Navidad and Matanza, given that their towns sort of make sense. But if you just look at it, you're like, oh, okay, that's yeah. cool. And then La Cuela yeah. is like... <laughs> All Latin, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some people, like English readers, tell me spiritual choreography doesn't sound really like English. Uh, yeah. The way the, the adjective and the, and the noun comes together, uh, they feel there's something non-English in that. And I like that. Yeah. Me too, that's what I liked about it. Because it, it does sort of stop you up short when you, when you read it. It's like, okay. Yeah, remember we talked a little bit about that, uh, Will? Like, could be like uh, a choreography of the spirits or something like that, more, more normal. Or just choreographies, I think. Was yeah, it. yeah. Yeah, we were thinking about, or using a different word, a, a non-English word, right. to, to continue the... Continue the tradition. The tradition, right? <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so, but yeah, spiritual choreographies too, like through, through the marketing and, and the place within this, is that interview that you guys did, 
is really key to understanding it and, and key to like being able to talk about the book. And I think that that's one thing that we've always wanted to encourage is the translator's interaction with the author or the author speaking um, on their own behalf as to like how the book could be read and approached and like allowing that that conversation to be a centerpiece to the book getting out into the market is is key to me. I don't want I don't want it to be I want this to be the beginning of something rather than the the end result of something. Yeah. I think that that's kind of too goes back to um something I was going to say about the Navidad Matanza process was that you brought it in as a fully first translation that you did before you got into the program, but then we did go through it so many times. And like and like there is a way I've been doing more of this now recently too of working with um with editing books and talking about them not so much as like a line edit. Like a lot of things that we did there would be like, is this word right or does this word fit? And we do have a, a weekly workshop um, here in town that we call Plube um, for reasons that are beyond at the moment or unnecessary to explain. But um, it's a weekly workshop where people bring in things that they're working on and a whole group, they're read out loud and a group of people then react to them. And a lot of that becomes about the individual word choices. But I think that there's something more that goes on with these sort of with this sort of book in particular, where the editing process and the interaction between the three of us and that part of the that part of the publishing process is almost more spiritual in a sense, where we're talking about how are you what how are you interpreting the book itself and how is that coming out into your English version rendering of the text? Like what are we emphasizing about different characters? How is the viewpoint that's underlying this? being represented in English and affecting the readers, that it's not just focusing on those individual words, but getting you as a translator to see the book as a whole and know how to make the words in English work that way. And without Carlos's input, that would seem to be a very difficult thing. So it's like kind of an interesting experience to be able to have you, Carlos, be very involved talking to Will about the translation and be able to, to think about it in this larger context, because we do have authors that we work with who want nothing to do with the translation, right. who are just like, whatever you do is fine. I'm not, I'm not an English expert. I don't, you know, you do it. I wrote this book 20 years ago, whatever you do, do. Um, and, and it, so something like this has a lot more, a lot more meaning to it and a lot more, uh, there's a lot more opportunity to, to, to find things like that or to find a way to approach the book that I think is, makes it more interesting. Yeah, and, and for me, that particularly, that particularly the experience in Rochester, working on this manuscript, I mean, it was, it was just really lucky for me because I was just, I was just learning to do what I was doing and being, being able to work with people who had published lots of translated literature, knew how to sort of push you in the right directions to, to find the patterns that, 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 make, a, that make a book, um, that, that make a style uh, recognizable and then working with the author as well. But I have to say, when, uh, when I first uh, correspond with you, Will, about uh, working, with, uh, working in Navidad and Matanza, and Matanza, sorry, um, I, I really like the, the fact that you, you knew about Chile, you lived in Chile, you had a relation. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't know if you have to be an expert in, in, in the subject you are translation, translating. I think you guys have different approaches to that or know about different approaches to that. But, but to me, like a very political uh, book like Navidad and Matanza, to me needed that some, someone had been in the streets in, 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 Chile, in Santiago de Chile, knew what I was saying, uh, was talking about the depression or Locuela, the depression of being or living in that like uh, perfect uh, country, uh, that is like a boiling, yeah. uh, is, 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 uh, um, and I, and I, I, to me it was really good that you had that insight. Yeah, no, I think that, that, um, that definitely helped a lot and especially Navidad and Matanza and Luquela are very much atmospheric um, in terms of capturing the, the feeling of the streets in Santiago or the feeling of the, of the Chilean coasts. Um, and that, those are things that impacted me a lot when I was living there. Like those experiences, I walked a lot in Santiago, I spent a lot of time on the beaches. And so yeah. like, being able to feel that, feel that definitely helped. I don't, like you said, I don't know if that's necessary for every translator in terms of, it really depends on the type of book, I think. But if they're, but, but it helped me. It helped, I mean, I saw that immediately when I started reading your work, that that was part of it. And that's something I love in literature in general. Yeah, connection, right? 
Mm-hmm. And with Spanish translate, translators, there tend to be, people tend to focus on a particular region. Like it could be Southern Cone, it could be Mexican, it could be Spain, but they they're, do tend to gravitate either for like the reasons that they like that particular literature, because each, each area has a slightly different uh, aesthetic that it's coming out, out of, even though it's all Spanish, right? But, um, and also like the slang, the various phrasings that are particularly to those, those countries and those Spanishes are very crucial. But there is something too about that culture, like knowing that culture and knowing how to represent it makes a big difference, I think, in how translators are good at certain certain areas and maybe not as as strong in others, and like where your affinities lie are really is really important to us as a as a publisher. Um, yeah. I want to take a second to encourage everyone to start asking questions. Um, so just to open up to questions, and we do have one. Um, that we can address right now is the question of would the translation of the book be made into an audiobook in the language it was translated into? Um, okay, so uh, uh, to answer this in one particular way, every book that we get the that we publish, we have to acquire the rights to both the underlying rights from the author, the author's agent, the author's publisher, and then the rights to the translation. So there are two separate contracts that we do that are basically dependent upon one another: the underlying rights and the translation rights. With the underlying rights are where we can acquire the right to do an audiobook. I have no idea this off the top of my head if we have the audiobook rights. There are books that we are we are starting to do. We are starting to try and do audiobooks given the the popularity of Audible and of this this medium and the its great growth over the past few years thanks to Audible, thanks to Amazon, and thanks to iPhones and and the ability to just listen to stuff and the fact that we all we all don't have enough time. Um, uh, but it is, and we have the two that we have two that were uh, that are in process that will hopefully come out in the not too dis- distant future that were like a test project, and we chose two slim slim books um, that we could that we could have read here on campus, um, and they are being read and produced in the English version. Okay. So, uh, so I we, think audiobooks audiobooks are are, are are very promising. Yeah, uh, yeah. You guys uh, listen to audiobooks? I do. I do sometimes, yeah. It's great, like when you, and because we we work in in in, in screens, right? Reading in, in in screens or reading even in books. So at the end of the, at the end of the day, you wanna uh, uh, practice literature or work, and you don't want to read, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> life saving. Life, life saving. Helps make running and exercising a lot easier too. Oh, that's great. Yeah, good idea. Or biking. Yeah, absolutely. Biking is my number one. Yeah, I can imagine a, an audio book of this that wouldn't be a straightforwardly read thing, but something with different voices, music interludes, lots of different possibilities. That would be great. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's, let's do it. Do it. Let's make it happen. Um, yeah. So one question for you, Carlos. What's next? Do you have an idea for the next book? And if so, how did you come up with an idea for it? I don't know. In English, we, we have to talk with Will and Chad. I think that's a, that's a, that's a conversation we have to have. Are you writing a, a new book in, in Spanish? Yeah, yeah. I'm writing, a, a, you know, my first novel in, in paper because my first novel was a, a hyper novel that, that lives in the internet back in the two, 2001. My first book in, in, in Spanish, was, uh, in, in, sorry, in, in paper was Libro de Plumas. You can translate how could I say it? Feather book, book? Book of feathers, book of plumes. Book of feathers, yeah. And that was almost 15, 16 years ago. And, and now I'm, I'm reading the, the continuation of that book with some of the characters, but based in, they are based in New York. They moved to New York. And, but it's a collective novel. I, I'm, I, I'm taking the, the structure of The Waves by Virginia Woolf but setting and in the streets of New York, a lot of characters, working class characters, and the daily suffering, and something is, is brewing, maybe an impeachment, maybe a revolution, and all the characters are, are, are talking. Um, so it's a continuation of my first novel, and at the same time, it's a new novel. Uh, I think it's less heady, how they say, more social, of course, um, but it, and it would be like an American novel, I think 500 or, or so, or more, like a, a thick book. So I have like two or three years, uh, if I can. Uh, I need, I need to, to have some money to, to finish. 
Very That's good. my next one. So here's a and, question. The and the title is uh, uh, Libro de Espuma, like foam book, like foam, like the beer foam. Right. Interesting. Love it. Here's a question for you, Will. What is your translation process like? Are you loyal to the Spanish original or do you want your readers to relate to the work? Also, do you take any liberty with your translation to add gloss slash translator's notes, et cetera? Hmm. Uh, I think, it, I think it, uh, this question of what you're faithful or loyal to often comes up in discussions of translation. And to me, it really depends on the work, on the book itself that you're working with. I try to find the thing that, at least to me subjectively, as, as a reader and as a translator, makes a work unique. Um, that can be a particular voice, that can be, you know, that can be a plot if it's a really a plot driven book, like whatever is most important, what at least that occurs to me is most important as, as a reader, um, I try to be faithful to that. So with Carlos's books, it's, it's about style, and it's about atmosphere, it's about rhythm, and the musicality of the language. Um, so yeah, I try, to, I try to be faithful to that, to what I see as the most important, sort of centrally important stylistic aspect. Um, I, yeah, what, what was the rest of the question? Um, that, do you use any, like do you gloss over, do you add gloss or translator's notes? I don't use notes. Sometimes I'll, in, if there's like a term that won't be um, relatable to English, English readers, I'll sometimes put a little interpolation, like I try to keep it fluid um, in terms of, and within the scope of the style of the book. Um, to, so just a little, like maybe, maybe a, a clause offset by commas or a little, or something offset by m dashes or a little parenthetical to sort of clarify, but, but also keeping it as, uh, as unimposing as, as possible. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And that's what when we, there are certain translators who we work with who uh, include a lot of footnotes in their submissions and they immediately get an email being like, this is going to be altered very heavily because I don't want footnotes if at all possible. Um, yeah, I've thought, about, I've thought about that a bit. And I was, I, I was, because there are some authors who like use, who do use footnotes as part of their style. And in that case, I think a translator could get away with doing their own footnotes. If yeah. they were able to make it sound like the author's voice, I think it's really annoying if, if there's suddenly another voice, unless it's like a multi-vocal book and like there can be another voice and you like set yeah. that up somehow. Or if the author is that can work. Or if the author is dead, like yeah. you can be like the authoritative. Right. Voice, right? <laughs> yep, they won't, they won't, they won't uh, complain at that point in time. But like a, a book that is very like that has a really recognizable style, like often there's explaining explaining that style or even explaining a, explaining a cultural reference kind of just disrupts the experience of of the reading. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Abs absolutely. I'm skipping around here a little bit. Um, I think this might be interesting. So how do you resolve differences if there are, were any between you and Carlos on the translation? Hmm. I don't, we it's haven't really had any conflicts ever. Like uh, conflict, conflict? We haven't had some, yeah. maybe some discussions, but we always like get to a, to a solution. Sometimes it's not, it's not conflict. Like sometimes you can feel that uh, uh, like a, a sentence is better in English like this, and you explain me like in English, it's, it's more natural. Because my English is, I've like, been here 10 years, it's, it's getting better and better, but at the same time, it's not my, I don't have the structure of the English in, in my head. You can notice guys in, uh, in the other side of the screen. Um, so my, my grammar, for instance, the, the Spanish grammar is so different. It's like a different source of, of, of grammar. Uh, so sometimes will uh, I say I will? I think this is uh, strange to me. And then no, you uh, you are uh, feeling that is strange because the in English is is better this way, and it's in conflict with my grammar. Yeah. But and sometimes I have to explain to Will some like words like gloss, uh, glossary some. Uh, yeah. Special words, right? Or, or if you have a particular sort of syntax 
that like is very intentional and that like needs oh, yeah. to be observed. And I haven't necessarily like caught out, caught on to that. You can you can you can. Yeah. I mean, we just have a very open dialogue about it, and I'm not. Neither of us is insisting that we're right. It's not really. It's a collaboration. No. So we don't really have conflict. And same same goes with the editing process with Chad and and with Kaya. Like, I, I'm totally open to their their critiques and their 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 input because I've always I've learned so much from them over the years about you know writing translations, which is, you know, that's what I do. And, and, um, and so, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's way more fun if you approach it as a collaboration and if you don't have too much ego about it. Yeah. And the same with, with, with Chad or Keja's uh, edits. Yeah, uh, yeah w maybe we can talk about that because when, yeah, Chad, you, you want to? I have a question that sort of brings that, that ties yeah. into that. So um, I'm modifying this. Uh, so if you're listening, you, you, you'll know what I'm talking about, but there's a question about when, Reading a translated book into English can be off-putting to the reader when he realizes it's been translated, translated, um, and literal translation may be correct, but the voice can get lost. How can this be avoided by editing the translation itself or dot dot dot? And I would say that there is this goes back to something you mentioned, Will, about the the discussion about like fidelity and like if you're if you're close to the source text or to the target language. And um, at Alta this past weekend. Edwin Frank, uh, the editor and publisher of New York Review of Books, was but this came up in a, on one of our panels. And he's like, I just think the whole conversation is a red herring. Like it doesn't, like what you you could go down intellectual academic rabbit holes that preference the original and like talk about what's being lost or what you're trying to what's what fidelity means or what you're 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 closest to. But really, like in the end, you're reading this book that's a new creation that is a new book in English. And it has a new way of functioning now that it's entered into this sphere. So there's things that that are just different. It's not lost. It's not. It's not anything. It's just there is a separate. And there is a problem. I have a the big academic um, uh, axe to grind with the idea that we privilege the original and the author's genius as sort of like untouchable, and that the translation is therefore always going to be lesser, or everything's going to be lesser than that. And that I don't think is true, especially in situations of translation where there's a collaboration between multiple people to make something that's a new object. So one thing that we do to avoid what you're, what, what's being referred to here, like of that sort of awkwardness or the, the kind of stiltedness that can come from being too literal is that we've taken to, and whenever possible, reading the books aloud to hear how it's sounding in English. And this has been a big help for younger emerging translators to hear what they've written. Cause we're, we're so frequently tied to screens, like you mentioned, and to seeing things and sort of reading them with our eyes and not with our not with our brains and not with our like uh, our our real uh, all of our senses. Right. Yeah. So hearing it read out loud can suddenly be like, oh, that phrase is so awkward. Or like, yeah, that might have been what it said in the original, but we say that in Spanish, but in English, it's a lot much many fewer words reordered. We say things in this way. If I want to emphasize this element of this this author of this character's personality, I need to choose a different sort of approach to get to to that that. Thing. I can't use the same words. I can't use the same sequence. So reading it aloud has been a, been a yeah. huge difference. It made a huge difference in talking about it. I, I think we lost Will, but I want to add something, something to what you were saying. That if you if you hear hear what you're you're saying from a marketing point of view, it's the same. I think a great thing about Open Letter is that you guys strategize how to market a book based on what, what the book is, not what the book should be. I think a, a, pro a problem that the uh, book market, because I, I, I also work in, in the book market here. Uh, so the a problem about the, the, the culture of books in the United States and in general uh, that is that everything has to be standardized to a market. But the new, the new thinking about marketing is that everything can be marketable. Like think about Instagram and Facebook and all, all those stuff. And I think uh, Open Letter is, is doing the right thing. And first you find, you find uh, books that you are passionate about. And then you find how to uh, translate it, how to market it, how to reach. Uh, and sometimes the reach is not very big, but it's because not all people and books are meant to be uh, massive. Right. But you can find a niche, right? And then that niche is enough for a, for a book, for instance. Yeah, I've used this. I don't remember if I ever said this out loud or I've just said it to people privately. But there is like 
th that sense of like, oh, we need to find a book that we can sell to all these people is fine. There, there's, a, there's a need for that for publishers to stay in business and everyone to stay in business and to, to make a, a amount of money. But there are also a, a smaller core group of readers that, that like a particular thing and they deserve their thing too. Like we deserve our experimental literature that might reach you know, 2000 people but those 2000 yeah. people be greatly changed or satisfied by this. And that satisfaction means just as much as like something that reaches 200,000 people. And that's, a, and that's a lot for me as a writer. 2000 people is, to me, is big as yeah. an experimental writer. I agree. I, yeah, absolutely. Um, there is a, a couple of questions we'll try and run through here as we're getting close to the end. One was how involved um, you guys were in the marketing and promotion beyond the event in Texas that was mentioned. And then a question of, there, is there any involvement from uh, both of you, Carlos and Will, that we could see being useful in doing another book together? Um, and I think it's, yeah, I mean, part of it was uh, doing the interviews and doing a lot more of a way of interpreting and having you two involved in talking about the book and in talking about how to talk about the book more so than uh, events per se. We did the tour for, for La Quela, which is very fun and went to a number of different lo locations but tours have, have become less reliable than they were in the past. Events generally have become either like questions of like, there'll be three people or there'll be 30. There'll be yeah. three people who all buy the book. There'll be 30. No one buys the book. Everything's like just up in the air. Like everything devol revolves around luck and timing and which are two things that you generally can't control. Um, so in terms of marketing, I think, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's interesting. I, I, we try and involve people as much as possible and it's a big advantage to open letter that we recently last year hired a marketing and publicity person who's very connected and is able to be working on this full time instead of when I was doing the other books it was like yeah that among a million other things but yeah, he's always like having the communication among everyone to be able to figure out what best way to find a readership for the books hey guys can you hear and see me again now yeah yeah, yeah. You're back. We, the, the internet went out there was a power outage here in San Cristobal so but I'm on my phone, so hopefully, hopefully it works. Perfect. Yeah, it works. I'm gonna I'm gonna answer one really quickly. That is um, a question of whether we get someone who knows Spanish to read the original. Not checking for the translator's quality, um, but in literary translation because that's subjective in literary translation. But do we get someone to read the original for you to stick with the voice style and the mind of the author? And we do not do that. I know other presses um, like Random House has done that of having kind of like checks of like they'll have the translation have someone read the original and check it. This will generally be for like Carlos Fuentes or Vargas Llosa. I believe in a more creative, um, interpretive aspect to this in which I'll pay attention to the voice and bring up a lot of questions with the, with the translator if it seems like something has gone awry. And having been in this for two decades, uh, um, it's starting to like, it's, it becomes very much easier to point out like something seems off and then have the translator be like, oh yes, like I've, I've misread this or I wasn't thinking about it this way. And I, I prefer to just ask a lot more questions than to dictate things and to just let people try and, and work together to think through them. Um, but not, not I, I think I have enough faith in the translators that we work with for one reason or another, either the quality of their work, the quality of the conversations, the reputation that they have, that I don't talk up on them with another person because that tends to revolve and devolve into saying like, oh, well, this word should be this word. And then what are you really, what are you checking at this point? You're not checking the, I mean, what are we even doing? You're just like trying to find, find a reason to say that the translator made some small mistake. And that's not it. I don't think that that's Edmund. Yeah. The book itself. Shaming, yeah. shaming. Yeah, no shame. No shame. Okay, so um, Will, what is the key to your success as a literary translator? And, and let's tie that together. So what is the key to your success as a literary translator? Plus, as a new, how should a new translator approach a book publisher? Whew. Um, the key to my success, I think, you know, was, was ending up at, at the University of Rochester and um, the fact that you and I, Chad, had similar taste and, you know, that I was, that I was really committed to working on translations before I even did that, the academic program. Um, and then, then I just got lucky in, in, in having ended up there and like the fact that we had similar interests and, and that you, you liked my translations and you helped me, you know, you gave me a shot, which, you know, I think that is, that is how it works for a lot of people. You end up making 
connections and, and you get a shot. It's also about being persistent and, you know, being humble, being ready to, being ready to learn, um, to take criticism. I remember the first time I went to a, a PLUB meeting at, at, in Rochester, I was doing a, a it, wasn't a, it wasn't one of Carlos's books, I was working on a different book, but, but, but PLUB is really a, a great environment for, for cultivating humility because, be, and also like for taking criticism and, and for learning because it's not so much that like, that your, your work gets made fun of, but people like give you the perspective of what a, how, how a, an actual reader might, might an, a reader of the English language might come to view this translation. And, and they really, they really, it can really change the way you, you read your own translations. And that's really an important thing for a translator to learn um, early on is that you have to, like you can get real caught up in thinking like you just nailed it, you know, you got it just right. And like, you're being very faithful to whatever you're deciding to be faithful to. But like, you really need to be able to take that step back and be like, how, how is an external reader gonna read this? And, um, and yeah, and just to be humble and to allow, and to, to allow people to, uh, to give you feedback. And, uh, and yeah, and I just, I just got lucky. That's, that's how I've been successful. I think. <laughs> is a part of it. I'm gonna say luck is definitely a part of everything, but um, uh, also like being able to present the book in a way that makes sense to the publisher and not yeah. just, yeah, I, I just went through a bunch of, I'm trying to formulate how to talk about this and there will be, if you follow the 3% website, there will be something more about this in the near future, but how, how best for translators to present their work that will make it resonate most with, with publishers. Because I think there's a little bit of disconnect that have gone on between the two spheres. Um, last question before we have to wrap up, I'm gonna make these one and I'll try and answer it. Um, one part of a question is, is it necessary to first obtain permission from the author if you already have a book in mind to translate? And the other question is, what are the biggest challenges in working with translators? And I'll say that these two have the same answer in a way, is that yes, well, you don't need to acquire the, you don't need to acquire, you don't need to acquire permission per se. What you need to know is if the rights are free. And the biggest problem that we have is, is if someone does not know that the rights to the book are no longer available, that another publisher has bought them, another translator is working on the book, and they submit it to us, and we get excited and find out that the book's not even available. Yeah. I mean, that, that is, of course, if you want to publish your translation. If you, yeah. just, if you yeah. just want to translate a book, you can translate anything you want. Yeah, you're free. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you can translate anything you want, but we can only do it if we can acquire the rights. And if the rights aren't available and we spend a lot of time marching down a particular road, that becomes really frustrating. To take it outside of just translators and say the biggest challenge, biggest challenge is working with agents. We're trying to like get, trying to drum up lots more money and interest and, and tend to use presses of our size to kind of like bait for larger offers. That, that process of being really invested and passionate about a book and no longer, we're at a point in time where the translation industry has grown enough, translation publishing has grown enough that there's no one who's like the only game in town. And, and agents have seized upon that and it's made it to a point where it's like tough to say like, oh, I love this book. We're going to definitely be able to publish it because then you find out, no, that's just not going to happen. So, well, thank yeah. you all. Thank you guys for doing this and thank everyone thank for you. listening and asking so many great questions. Really appreciate your interest in this webinar and in the topic and hopefully you'll go out and, and get all of Carlos and Will's books. So yeah, yeah, get, thank go, you, go, everyone. Go, get, go get Carlos's books and, and definitely special thanks to the Authors Guild for doing this and for including translators in their in their membership. Yeah. That's really that's really important and, and it's and you know we feel privileged to be included in these conversations. So yeah thanks. Yeah, thanks. Okay. yeah and thank you everyone. Bye, Chad. Bye, bye, Will. Bye, Umair. Bye, bye Carlos. Bye, Chad. Great to see you guys. Great to see bye. you guys. Yeah.